Namaste, everyone, and uh, welcome to our satsang uh, this morning. So we will continue this morning with our discussion of Vibhishana Gita. I will begin with a brief summary of what we discussed last time in case um, some of you, I know some of you were not able uh, to, to join us, but it's a brief summary and then uh, to continue our discussion. So this, these verses that I am uh, sharing with you, these verses come from the Ramayana, but in this case, from the version of the Ramayana, the Ram Charit Manas, authored by uh, Tulsi Das in the 16th uh, century. This is, he wrote uh, his version of the Ramayana in the language of the people, the common people. He used the dialect of Hindi, uh, Avadhi. So in this section of the Ramayana, in Tulsi Das's version, it occurs in the Lanka Khand in Valmiki, it, this corresponds to the Yudha Khand or the battle, the battle chapter, the battle uh, scene. So the, he sets the scene with, you know, Sri Ram facing uh, the might of Ravana, the well-equipped army of Ravana. And Vibhishana had just come from uh, Lanka, Sri Lanka to join uh, Sri Ram, and he knew of the great might of his brother as a warrior, his well-equipped army, um, his tremendous uh, military resources. And uh, Vivishan was very troubled, he was very disturbed. And uh, Tulsi Das uh, says in the text, uh, Ravana, Ravanu Rati Virata Ragubira. So Ravana has a, a beautiful chariot, Ratha, but uh, Ram, Sri Ram is Virata. He is, he is without uh, a, a chariot. He is not well militarily uh, equipped. Dekhi Vibhishana Bhayahu Adhira. And when Vibhishana saw this, his heart trembled with concern, his heart trembled with, uh, with fear. Adhika priti manabha sandeha bandi charana kaha sahita saneha. And so he wanted to draw this to uh, Ram's attention. And he did so in a very uh, polite and respectful manner, expressing his anxiety, expressing his concern. Natana rata nehitana paratrata. He says, Sri Ram, you do not have you do not have a chariot, and uh, you don't you are not uh, you don't even have uh, shoes on your on your feet. You are without armor for your body uh, for your head. You have no bodily armor, nor do you have uh, a military vehicle. Kehi vidhiji taba vira balawana. How will you win this battle? How would you defeat? Ravana in, in war, so ill-equipped as, as you are. So he's expressing this uh, concern, but he does so uh, very, very lovingly. Uh, Tulsi Das says, Adhika Preeti, with a heart full of, of love. And so, you know, uh, Sri Ram says, yes, you know, you, my friend, you have spoken, you have spoken truthfully, you have spoken well. But uh, the chariot of war is not the only chariot. There is another chariot. Jehi Jayahoi so Syandana Ana. There is another chariot that I want to tell you about. And this is a chariot that brings a different kind of, of victory. A meaning, the, the, the victory that is meaningful, the victory that is uh, enduring. Sri Ram does not take offense at anything that Vibhishana said. Um, you know, as, as I said last day, one can take offense at a remark like this because Vibhishana could be interpreted as saying, well, I don't think you can defeat Ravana. You're not prepared. He's a much better uh, a warrior and um, he's, you're not going to win this, this uh, war. 
But Sri Ram looked deeper, and I spoke quite a bit about this looking deeper. He looked to the source of Vibhishana's words, and he saw that uh, Vibhishana was speaking from a place of love, from a place of uh, concern for him, and not, not uh, to demean him, not to, to put him uh, down as a, as a warrior. So in response to Vibhishana's concern, Sri Ram says, listen, my friend, Sunahu Sukha, Sakha Kaha Kripa Nidhana, full of understanding, full of love for Vibhishana. He says, Jehi Jaya Hoi So Syandana Ana. But there is another chariot that I want to tell you about. And so he, this is a chariot that leads to a different kind of victory. It's not the one that Ravana is, is using. That's the chariot of war. That is the Yudharatha. But this is not the only chariot. There's a more important uh, a chariot, which is the chariot of virtue. Uh, it is the Dharma, the Dharmaratha, as opposed to the Yudharatha. And this is, this is the core, this is the basis of this whole uh, discussion. A chariot of life uh, that leads to enduring well-being, that leads to a deeper happiness and a deeper fulfillment, the chariot of meaningful uh, living. And then he goes on to describe the, the different elements, the components of this chariot of righteous life, the, the Dharma uh, Ratha, in the next series of verses, which will begin, which I'll discuss with you this morning. So first, <laughs> chanting the beautiful poetry of uh, Tulsidas. Sauraja dheeraja tehiratha chaka Satyashila drida dvajapataka Sauraja dheeraja tehiratha chaka Satyashila drida dvajapataka Bala viveka dhamma parahita ghore, shama kripa samata rajujore. Bala viveka dhamma parahita ghore, shama kripa samata rajujore. Saura jadhira jatehi chaka. Satya Shila Drida Dwaja Pataka Bala Bibeka Dama Parahita Ghore Shama Kripa Asamata Raju Jore. So, what we are offered here is a very different way of thinking about power, an alternative way of thinking about success, victory. No chariot moves without wheels. The entire structure rests on these wheels. And in ancient times, the, the chariots had two, two wheels, not four, four wheels. So he begins by naming the two wheels of this chariot of virtue, the Dharma Ratha. And what are these? Saura Raja, Tehi Ratha Chaka, the wheels Chaka are what he calls Sauraj and Dhiraj. Sauraj Dhiraj Tehi Ratha Chaka. What are the wheels, Vibhishana, of this chariot of life? The one that, the chariot that we should really be journeying with. So life is a journey and what, and this is the chariot that I want you to journey with, not the chariot of violence, but the chariot of, of virtue. And what are the wheels of this chariot. Sauraja Dhiraja. Sauraja is courage. It is bravery. It is valor. And Dhiraja is resilience. It's patience. It's fortitude. There is no movement in life without Sauraj or courage. 
without sourj courage we live paralyzed by fear unwilling to undertake risks or embark on on new ventures to take new steps in life to walk new new journeys to climb new mountains without sourj we lack faith in ourselves faith and trust in ourselves we are always obsessed with fear and especially the fear of of failure you may remember the bhagavad gita verse in chapter 6 where sri krishna says nayam nayam lokosti na paro na sukham samshayat manaha that a human being who is always doubting herself or himself samshayat manaha always doubting his or her abilities his or her capabilities na i am loko not in this world i am lokaha na para lokaha not in any other world sukham na sukham will never attain happiness in this world or in any other in any other world one who always doubts herself or himself does not gain happiness fulfillment in this world or in another world because he or she always lives in in a condition of of fear and sauraj is the very opposite of that not that one must be unrealistic but fear should not be a source of paralysis um in in our in our life certainly there are challenges but we can't succumb and be immobilized by fear of undertaking uh, challenges and at the same time while the gita tells us you know that there can be no joy for a person who lives perpetually in doubt about herself or herself in this world or in any other world the gita also reminds us in the same sixth chapter uddharet atma anatma nam na atmanam avasadhayet one should not demean oneself na atmanam avasadhayet one should have confidence in one's abilities in one's uh, capacities if you don't then you are the enemy of yourself atmay vari pura atmanah one becomes one's own greatest uh, enemy but sauraj must be complemented by dheeraj so these are the twins the twin wheels of the chariot sauraj and and dheeraj very beautiful uh, words if sauraj is is courage faith in one's self belief in one's abilities then dheeraj dheeraj is resilience steadiness so courage to undertake new actions uh, sauraj must be accompanied by persistence persistent efforts we can't be courageous only at the beginning and uh, give up as soon as the undertaking gets gets uh, difficult dheeraj dheeraj also means patience overcoming the expectations that results will always be quick rapid uh, immediate so we can't be courageous only at the beginning and not be resilient not be committed to persisting persistent hard hard work there is a expression in sanskrit uh, arambha shura arambha shura means uh, being heroic <laughs> being courageous only at the beginning it describes you know a human being who is unable to take anything to its completion energy is only there to start a project um, to start a venture but not not to take it to its uh, completion so such a person is arambha shura heroic courageous but only arambha only at the at the very beginning so there is no movement in life if we take the metaphor it 
uh, Ramayana is using here. There's no, there's no movement. The chariot of life does not move, does not go forward without the wheels of Sauraj, courage, and Dhiraj, persistence, devotion to completing uh, a journey. So I think it, what we should, it's a very good question to ask ourselves. You know, if we, if we look back upon our own lives, the journey of our own lives, and we had to tell our children or we had to tell our grandchildren about ourselves. What would you say, you know, is the most important event in which you or I, the most important undertaking in which we exhibited Sauraj? What, you, what would we regard as the most courageous action that we undertook in the fear of perhaps the uncertainty and uh, not knowing what the outcome might might be. What would you identify with, as the Sauraj, the event of Sauraj in your own life or the event of, of the Hiraj, the wheels that move the chariot of our own individual lives? Sauraj Dhiraj Tehirat Chaka. So that's how Sri Ram begins, describing the wheels of the chariot, Sauraj, Dhiraj. Satya Shila Drida Dwaja Pataka. So chariots have flags, Pataka. What are the flags of this chariot of life? Ancient chariots had two flags. They were called Dwaja and Pataka. Dwaja is the main flag, Pataka the smaller flag. These flags were visible from a distance. You know, think of a vast battlefield. How do you know, you know, who are the warriors? You identify them by the flags. The flags were visible from a long distance and these were the primary identification marks of a warrior in those times. But not simply identifying them by the color, they told us something, these flags told us something important about the, the warrior. Arjuna, for example, on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, one of the names used for Arjuna is Kapidvaja. Kapidvaja. So one who's on whose chariot was the flag of Sri Hanuman. So he had the symbol of Hanuman on his chariot, and which says, you know, that he admired the virtues of, of, of Hanuman, that Hanuman was a heroic figure to Arjuna. So from a distance, Arjuna would be identified by other warriors because of this flag, the bigger flag that he, he carried. So what are the flags by which we should be identified? And Sri Ram says, these flags should be Satya and Shila. Satya Shila Drida Dwaja Pataka. The flags of my life, the flags of your life should be Satya and Shila. This is what uh, you, you should be identified with. This is what you should be known for. These should be your identity markers. Satya is, as you know, from Sat, Satya is truth, commitment to truth. And the Shila is good character, virtue. These should be our primary identity markers. This is what we should be known and remembered for. 
not a sat, not untruth. Satya is, is truth. We have an obligation to be the speakers of truth. Through, through truth, we earn the trust of, of others. Unfortunately, today, some speak of our era in which we live as a post-truth era. An era in which truth has lost its importance, it has lost its significance. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I shared it with you um, on the Gita list that Arunji distributes. I shared with you my 2021 Diwali reflection in which I took the line from the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, uh, the famous uh, prayer, Asatoma Sadgamaya, from untruth to truth. And I built a reflection around this important prayer, uh, ancient, thousand, thousands of years ago, the priest in the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad prayed to be led from untruth to truth, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. Today, as I said in that message, you know, we live in the midst of a culture of untruth, a culture that has come, unfortunately, to value very little um, truth. And as I said, social media has become a powerful instrument for disseminating uh, truth. I, I cited a research from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, um, uh, which is a very uh, important study of social media, which uh, established so clearly that on social media, untruths spread wider, they spread faster, and they spread deeper than truth. So this is a, a very challenging, and this gives you know heightened importance to you know to Sri Ram's words that we should be known for truth as individuals and as a, as communities and, and and nations. There is no trust uh, if we are not known for for truth. So Satya Shila. Satya Shila Drida Dwaja Pataka. So one flag is the flag of Satya or truth, and uh, the second flag is the flag of good character or integrity. That's, we can translate Shila also as integrity, which is the consistency, the harmony of thought, of word, of deed. Shila is freedom from hypocrisy. You know, the fragmentation of this harmony between thought, word, and, and deed. So in the absence of shila, integrity, we become deeply divided within ourselves. You know, I have thoughts, but these thoughts are not reflected in my actions or even in my, in my words. But shila is that beautiful flow of consistency between what I think, what I speak, and what I do. Satya puts the emphasis on speech. Shila, I think this is why uh, these two are combined here in this text. Satya Shila, Drida Dwaja Pataka, not Satya alone, but Satya and Shila. Uh, Satya puts the emphasis on the word, the speech, truthful speech, Shila on action. Bota, Bota, important. My word should be manifest in the character of my actions. And this is, you know, in the Yajur Veda, the teacher on the commencement day tells his students, Satyam Vada, you know, speak truthfully, but then adds, Dharmam Chara, but walk the path of virtue. Not only speak the speak, but walk the walk. Satyam Vada. Dharmam chara. Very beautiful balance, just like here. Satyam and Shila. Satyam there and, and uh, Dharma. So, in the traditional battlefield, when your flag fell, 
the fall of the flag signified your defeat, your loss. Here we are being taught that defeat happens when we deviate, when we, have, when we give up, when we surrender truth and good character. That's when we begin to lose the battle of life, when we compromise these fundamental ethical values, when they are absent from our lives, when we no longer value them, we don't strive to cultivate these. You know, failure is not the, failure here is not the issue. It is, it is relinquishing the effort itself or, 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 or not valuing uh, truth and, and integrity. Let these be, in other words, let these be the virtues. If must the flags identify the chariot of the warrior, let the flags of truth and integrity be the virtues for which we are known, for which we are, by which we are identified, for which we are remembered. I think this is the message here of, uh, uh, of Sri Ram. So the two wheels of the chariot, Satya and Sheila. And what are the horses? There's no, the chariot doesn't have any momentum of its own. It needs the energy of the horses to move those two, those two uh, wheels. So what are the horses of this, uh, of this uh, uh, chariot? And uh, so Sri Ram says, Bala Bibeka Dhamma Parahita Ghore, horses Ghora. What are the horses that move this uh, chariot? Because, it, of course, you, you need good horses, healthy horses, energetic horses to move the wheels of your chariot uh, forward. So, what are the four noble horses of the chariot of, of life that is being commended here? for us. Bala, Tulsidas, again, you know, writing in his beautiful Avadhi um, script, the language of the people, he writes Bibeka in Sanskrit, it's Viveka. Dhamma, he uses Parahita. So he gives four uh, important uh, virtues, one corresponding to each of the four horses. Bala is strength. Bala is strength. It includes the physical, but not only. We focus often on physical might, physical strength. But in so many ways, we see that that's, that's one form of, of strength. That's one form of, of power. And it does not always succeed. And if it succeeds, it often succeeds in the short in the short term. We see this in our lives as individuals. We see it in our lives as, as nations. The Bala of the United States, all of its military might fail in so many, at so many moments in our world. Think about all the wars in which we have been involved in the last 50 years with such great military Bala. that didn't lead us to success. In the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna speaks about Bala. He uses the word Bala, Balam as well. This is in the seventh uh, chapter. I'm sure many of you remember this verse. Balam balavatam chaham kama raga vivarjitam dharma viruddho bhuteshu kamos me bharatar shabha. So he says there, Balam Balabatam Chaham. I am Chaham. I am, what am I? I am the strength in you. I am Balam. I am the strength in the human being, but Kama Raga Vivarchitam. That strength that comes from Freedom from greed, that strength that of a human being when she or he is free from greed and free from raga, self-centeredness, narrowness, 
of 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 vision i am the strength of the strong balam balavatam devoid free from greed and free from ego centeredness so when we think and act without greed and ego centeredness focus only on the narrow, narrow self interest we act from wisdom we act from clarity of mind and there is a different kind of strength balam strength with greed and self centeredness is brute force the balam that shri ram is commanding here is the balam of a martin luther king the 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 strength that comes from moral commitment the strength that comes from moral energy and there have been so many heroic people in our world who exhibited this kind of balam uh not the balam of brute force but the balam of moral commitment to a a cause and i would say bala here is is moral strength and it's very clear that in the hindu tradition uh and there's very specific verses to this point that um there is an energy that is released you know when we liberate ourselves from from greed we replace one kind of motivation with a deeper and a richer spiritual motivation again just to to connect with the uh, another sacred text of bhagavad gita you may recall that verse sakta karmanya vidvamso yatha kurvanti bharata kuriyar vidvams tatha sakta chikirshu loka sangraham even as those who are subject to greed act energetically for their own purposes for their own ends so also one can act so also action is possible so also balam is possible kuriyar vidvams tatha asakta in the same way a wise human being can act with balam with energy but for the good of the world loka sangraha is used here in this way he said i want you to act as energetically as those who act for their own purposes i hold before you the ideal of energetic and devoted action for the well being of of others so the first horse is the horse of moral strength not giving up <laughs> our moral causes not giving up our moral battles for justice for human dignity for the well being of of others and what is the second horse if bala is the first horse what is the second horse here is where he says the word uses the word viveka or in tulsidas's language viveka the verb becomes the the ba viveka discernment discernment wisdom strength must be complemented with with wisdom and there is so much discussion you know in our tradition about what is viveka we have discussed this many times previously some of you were there when i um taught the tattva board of of shankara and you might remember the list of virtues there we spoke of sadhana chatushtaya the fourfold means the fourfold disciplines the fourfold sadhana and in actually the first of those was viveka followed by vairagya and in this in this particular verse uh, uh, the ramayana seems to be echoing the sadhana um chatushtha and there in 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 the text that were bor viveka is this defined as nitya anitya nitya anitya vastu viveka is the ability to tell the difference between what is transient what is not not that it's not unimportant but one but things those things that have limited value those things that are not enduring anitya is called in sanskrit and those things that have enduring value nitya nitya and anitya to tell the difference between what is enduring and what is transient and to give your energies more to what is 
nitya, what is enduring, to, to value what those things are truly value, and to see in proper perspective those things that are, are transient, that are subject to change, are not, not lasting. To know the limits of the finite is what this quality of Viveka uh, points to. To have the right perspective on the difference between the transient and the enduring, the non-eternal and, and the eternal is, is Viveka. And so Viveka complements Bala. That kind of discernment complements Bala or, or strength. It's also a source of important strength. Strength without wisdom can be uh, dangerous. It can be misapplied. It can be misused. So that's the second horse. The first horse is Balam. The second horse is Viveka. So what's the third horse? Should not surprise you. This also comes from Sadhana Chatushtaya. He says the third horse is Dhamma. Dhamma. Bala, Viveka, and then Dhamma. So Dhamma is self-control. Control of the senses control of the organs of action, mindful. Uh, Dhamma is mindful acting, mindful about one's speech, one's, one's physical uh, habits, uh, uh, alert and mindful uh, living. That's exactly what Dhamma in, in, in Sadha, in uh, Tattva Bodh, Dhamma is de defined as Chakshuradi, Bahindriya nigraha. So chakshurari, the eyes and other senses, and uh, the organs of action in the body, nigraha. Exercising mindfulness in the way in which we use our bodies, in the way in which we use our, our sense organs. So ultimately we don't hurt ourselves or we don't hurt um, others. And then, so and what is the fourth horse? He says, so we're seeing each horse. Um, Bala Viveka Dhamma Parahita. Parahita. He doesn't mention Shama here, which is mentioned there in the Sadhana Chatushtaya, but I think it's implied in everything that he has, he has said here. In, in Tattva Bodha, uh, Shama is uh, defined as Mano Nigraha, control of the mind. But control of the mind is implied in control of the senses, control of the organs of action. But the fourth horse is really important and interesting. What is that? It's parahita. Parahita, he said. Parahita. So just, uh, just remember, strength, discernment, wisdom, control, self-control, and parahit. Commitment to the well-being of others, parahita. Commitment to the well-being of other, of other living beings. And I think that he mentions this as one of the four horses after strength, <clears throat> discernment or wisdom and self-control because he wants to remind us that the cultivation of these virtues should not also be focused only on one's own self-development. That's important. But we, we can't. Spirituality should not be inward looking or only focused on self, self growth or self development. But all of these must also serve the well being of the community of living beings of which one is a part. And this is what he says Parahit. The cultivation of virtue must also be oriented in care and compassion for others, or else. That's an essential part of the chariot of life. Or else our spirituality becomes, and it can become, <laughs> so many examples of it, it can become self-centered. Even spirituality can become self-centered. If we don't remind ourselves of this value of parahita. Parahita. We belong to a community of living beings that includes our planet as well all interrelated, all interconnected, all inter interdependent. And this whole flourishes only when we are all committed to each other's well-being. Even as we grow in virtue, virtue finds its fulfillment in compassion. 
in Parahit. So Parahit is one of the, the, the four horses of, of this chariot. You know, Mahatma Gandhi used to say, because um, he was in our times, you know, uh, one of the champions of Ahimsa, but he often said, you know, that Ahimsa means not hurting others, non-injury, uh, which is a negative prefix, and Ahimsa is hurting or injuring. So Ahimsa literally means not hurting. But uh, Gandhiji used to say, but that's very incomplete. That's only one side of the coin. The other side of the coin of Ahimsa is Parahit. Parahit. You know, because you can say, look, I don't hurt anybody. So I am, you know, fulfilling what the meaning of Ahimsa is. He said he, that would be incomplete. It's something more active. And the active energy of Ahimsa is Parahit. Is commitment to the well-being of others, actively promoting the flourishing of other human beings, which Tulsidas has a very beautiful uh, line also in this in this poetic composition where he says, Parahit, he uses the word parahit also. Parahita sarisa dharmanahi. Parahita sarisa dharmanahi. There is no virtue higher than compassion and commitment to the well-being of others. Parapi dasama adhama nahi. And there is nothing unrighteous as being unjust and oppressive uh, to, to others. So these are the four horses, the chariot wheels, the horses, and then of course, the horses are controlled by the reins of the chariot. What are the reins of the chariot? Shama Kripa Samata Rajujore. Shama Kripa Samata. So he mentions three reins. And I've read some interesting accounts on, you know, there are four horses, but why are there only three reins? Well, to, to remove <laughs> that, that doubt and not be stuck on a question <laughs> like that is because according to people who studied, you know, history and, and, and the traditions of, of chariot and, and warfare, they said that the first two horses that led each had a rein because they were at the front of the chariot. But the, the horses, the, the, the horses at the, the, the second row of horses, because they, were, they, were, they could only follow the first two horses, the chariot controlled them by having one, one rein. There was, there was no need for, for, for each horse to have a separate rein. So traditionally, four horses, but only three, um, three, three reins. And that's, 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 that makes a lot of uh, sense. So what are the three reins of the chariot of, of a good life? First one he says is, he uses the word chama in Sanskrit, kshama, shama, shama or having a forgiving nature, forgiveness. And then the second reign is Kripa, Shama Kripa. Kripa is compassion, Shama Kripa, and Samata. Shama Kripa, Samata. Samata is uh, calmness, a calm disposition. Calmness is Samata or evenness. Equilibrium, all of these are appropriate ways of uh, translating uh, Kshama. So Shama is, is forgiveness. It is not forgetting. I often you know, think it is sometimes unrealistic to say that to forgive one must, one must forget. Perhaps there is some way in which that statement might be, might be meaningful, but you know, if you've suffered something unpleasant, it, it does survive as a memory um, in one's, at the level of one's mind or in the level of one's emotions. It can't be easily expunged. But even as one remembers uh, uh, such an act or such an event, it doesn't mean that, it, that memory can't also be combined with an attitude of forgiveness. So it's sometimes unrealistic uh, when we speak about that forgiveness requires 
forgetting. Forgiveness is healing, but it doesn't require also the, it doesn't, it's not easy to expel the memory. And I give you, we, we gave an example already. Um, I give you an example of Sita in our first lecture where, you know, Hanuman wanted to destroy the woman who guarded her in Ashoka. And she looked deeper and she says, no, um, we must forgive them because they are also the victims of an authoritarian um, ruler. I don't think they had a choice in what they, they, they did. She saw them, she, she forgave uh, because she understood that um, they were also victims. So Shama is not condoning, <laughs> that's also important. It's not condoning or encouraging that which is manifestly wrong. But seeing wrongful actions as having a deeper source in ignorance, in avidya, and Shama certainly is controlling one's own reactions, one's own reactions. I can't always change the behavior of someone who is acting in inappropriate and hurtful ways, but through my own understanding, I can control my, my, my response. And I think that that's goes into the heart of forgiveness. I can heal myself of the wounds that were inflicted um, upon, upon me. So Kshama is one of the reigns. The second one is uh, Kripa or, or compassion. Um, in the Hindu tradition, uh, compassion is defined as para dukha dukha, sukha sukha. Compassion is empathy. The ability to, to know intimately, to experience the suffering of another. So para dukha dukha. The capacity of a human being to suffer when others suffer. And Sukha, Sukha, and the capacity to rejoice in the happiness of, of others. That's, that's Kripa. So it's identity with others. Kripa is identity with others in suffering and in joy. Not only those who are intimately related to us, you know, members of our family, members of our community, members of our country, but beings everywhere. Kripa is identity with the suffering and the flourishing of living beings everywhere, not limited by, by boundaries of, you know, genetic ties or national identity and, and so forth. But it's a very beautiful definition, para dukkha dukkha sukha sukha. It's an active virtue. And the practice of kshama and, uh, and uh, kripa, compassion, I think these, these bloom, these contribute to the maintenance of samatha, of a certain calmness. Because our inability to forgive causes such deep pain within us that there is no samatha. There is no calmness of heart. And if I cannot rejoice when others are happy, you know, if every time I see someone flourishing, I see the prosperity of another, if I can't also rejoice uh, in the prosperity of others, it causes deep disturbances in my own heart and mind. And there's no samatha. There is no samatha because I'm perpetually subject to wishing, wishing the for the failure of the other. I want the other to, to fail so that I can be seen, I can perceive, be perceived as a, as a person of success. But in that kind of attitude, there is no shanti. There is no, there is no samatha, there is no calmness. But one who is able to rejoice in the joy of others and to empathize with others in, in moments of unhappiness, in, more, in times of suffering, is someone whose experiences or knows was samatha, is calmness. As Bhagavad Gita says, Bhagavad Gita gives a very beautiful definition of yoga. And so Krishna says in three words, <laughs> samatha, samatvam yoga uchyate, samatvam yoga uchyate. He says, what is yoga? 
What is the purpose of yoga? Samatvam. Samatvam, yoga. Yoga is this attitude of balance, of tranquility, of composure uh, in one's own heart, in one's own uh, mind. Samatvam yoga uchyate. So the three reigns, remember, um, Kshama, Kripa, and Samata. The two wheels, Sauraj and Dhiraj. And uh, the four horses, what are the four horses that we, we spoke about? Balam, strength, Viveka, discernment, wisdom, Dhamma, self-control, Parahita, dedication to the well-being of, of, uh, of others. So he's building up the, the different, beautifully constructing the elements of this chariot of life. And then next is, who is the chariot? Who is the Sarati? Who is the Sarati? Who drives this chariot? You know, in Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna had Krishna for his chariot. But who, who will drive the chariot of our lives? And uh, I will commence from then when we, when we continue um, the discussion of Vivishana uh, Gita. So I will uh, stop here and we have just about five minutes if, if you had any um, points on today's discussion that I could clarify or Anant, put upon. Uh, here. Yes. Uh, I must say, this is one of the best talks that you've ever given. <laughs> it is right. beautifully right. explained, beautifully explained. Uh, I read through uh, Tulsidhar Sis and I could not connect his thought in the way he explained what he was thinking. Secondly, when you talked about Arambhashura, yeah. the thought of Prince Uttara came to my mind. Okay. Go ahead, say some more about him. More very, very, very active, energetic at the beginning, but then immediately fade away. That's that's not Shura, Aramba Shura. Thank you. It's so, a very good talk. Could I ask you something? You don't have to answer me, uh, Prasannaji. If I had to ask you, what would you regard as a maybe a very courageous act, Sauraj, in your own life, what would you, what would you point to? Getting married. <laughs> <laughs> and you will say Dheeraj is persistence. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, 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 has, that has given me everything. Shama, Dhamma, Shama, Samatvam. And so that particular action, which was the, uh, which was uh, taken. Yes. I think has uh, defined my life. That's a wonderful answer, Prasanaji, and I'm sure Usha will concur with you. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, John? What would you say? What would I say? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would go one step before marriage. And that is um, when Ivana and I were undergraduates in college, uh, we had an Indian professor, a botanist, uh, and we were in a casual conversation after lab one day, and he issued us a challenge. He said, you Swarthmore students, you're very smart, but you don't understand anything about how the rest of the world lives. And when we asked him what we should do about that, he said, come with me to India. Uh -huh. We did, and we got married in India, and that changed everything. <laughs> I think I like that one, John, because if I had to identify for myself, you know, what, what would be one of the preeminent acts of sour or your courage that I had to take, I would also say, you know, at age 21, uh, making a journey to India. At a time when very few people were traveling from my country to India and uh, joining, joining the life of an ashram um, during that time. It was a long journey. I, I look back at it now and I don't know if I would have 
if I would have <laughs> made that journey today, but I had the energy of energy and idealism of of youthfulness, as you know, <laughs> like yourself, <laughs> and um, made that uh, made that journey. I lost I lost about forty pounds in in six in in in, in within three months. I was terrified even to send a photo of, back to my parents. Wow. Um, because I know they would be horrified to see what their son uh, looked at. But, you know, the fruits, the fruits of that journey, uh, what really uh, blessed my life in, in so many ways, like yourself, going to India, you know, as a student from, from uh, Swarthmore. But I think each of us perhaps have, you know, Sauraj, moments in our in our life and the Dutch moments when we persisted in spite of doubts success came from a, a lot of persistence and even failures along the along the journey any other thoughts friends before we conclude yeah. nayana namaste. please namaste yes namaste i really enjoyed your talk today dr uh, Rambachan, um, as usual, of course. But, um, you know, I, so many years people have said, well, you know, the, the horses are like the senses, the five horses. And, you know, I know it's, it's just a metaphor and all of this. It's, it just, something represents something else. Yeah. Um, but the senses are the, I don't know, the five horses. Then now you use the four horses uh, for illustration purposes about, you know, our journey, our life journey, yes. and what are all the things. So, um, you know, I, I find a lot of compatibility with all yes. the scriptures because yes. of these things. It's the same repetitiveness, the compassion, courage, uh, self-control, etc. Yes. So just a comment, maybe you don't have to. <laughs> no, it's a very good... Um comment uh, and the connection okay. that you made because I didn't I didn't um, discuss it uh, this morning but of course um, before Tulsi Das in his own version developed this chariot analogy the perhaps an even earlier discussion which is where I think you're drawing and maybe next time I talk I can make that connection um, that you are pointing to is uh, occurs in Katha Upanishad Katha Upanishad has at least two verses specifically discussing um, the uh, uh, example, the metaphor, the analogy of the of the chariot and the chariot of the various paths. Yeah, and uh, I think that's where that's probably the oldest reference we have. Uh, Bhagavad Gita, you know, it, the 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 symbolism is there, of course, um, with Sri Krishna's Arjuna's chariot, but we don't have a verse in the Bhagavad Gita that develops, as I say, Tulsi Das does here, or Katha Upanishad does, develops the, the symbolism of the different parts of the chariot. So Katha Upanishad and now in um, Tulsi Das does it here in his own beautiful, <laughs> in his own beautiful way. And, and as you said, they all, all complement each other. They all enrich um, each other. But next time, I thank you for that reminder. I will share the Katha Upanishad verse also. <laughs> <laughs>